Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Robin Buxbaum and I'm the Strategic Partnerships Coordinator here at ACHA. This is our seventh ACHA COVID-19 webinar discussion. Today we are expanding upon the topic of housing as covered in the consideration for reopening institutions of higher education in the COVID-19 era guidelines put out by the ACHA task force. Next week, we will further explore the topic of contact tracing. If you've missed any of our past webinars, recordings are available on the ACHA YouTube channel. As another reminder, for all the latest updates, continue to check the ACHA COVID-19 website. At any time today, feel free to type a question into the questions pane on the right side of your screen. While we have allotted a fair amount of time at the end for Q&A, we may not get to all questions today. We do review that list after each webinar and have been using those questions to guide us in our work. One last item, those registered will receive a link to recording of today's presentation, so feel free to share that. But as I mentioned, it will also be posted on the YouTube channel. Let's get going. I'm pleased to introduce our four speakers today. Dr. David Anderson is Professor Emeritus of Education and Human Development at George Mason University, where he worked for nearly three decades as Professor and Director of the Center for the Advancement of Public Health. Prior to that faculty position, he served as a Residence Hall Director at The Ohio State University and Director of Residence Life at Radford University and then at Ohio University. Today, he remains active with research, writing, and consulting, and now serves on the ACHA COVID-19 Task Force. Christina Lowry is the Director of Residential Life and Housing at the University of Southern Maine. She has been a part of housing and residential education programs for 13 years and worked at a variety of institutions throughout the Northeast. Christina is on the Future of Housing Task Force for OQOI, which is exploring the issues residential programs are facing for fall 2020. Linda Casper is the Executive Director of University Housing at the University of Georgia. She previously served as Executive Director of Residential Education at the University of South Florida, Director of Residential Education and Associate Director of University Housing and Dining Services at Oregon State University, and Assistant Director for Residential Education at the University of Arizona. Dr. Jane Horton is the Director of Student Health and Counseling Services at Washington and Lee University. She has worked in the field of college health for over 30 years. She provides healthcare services to students and oversees operations at a 24 seven student health center, the University Counseling Center and the Office of Health Promotion. She is also part of the student affairs team at Washington and Lee, which has been developing plans for a safe and successful return of students to the new normal of campus. So first of all, welcome to everyone and thank you for joining us. I'm going to turn it out over now to Dr. Anderson to kick us off. Thank you so much, Robin. Appreciate the introduction. And as a very brief background, ACHA has been a leader in a wide range of health issues with colleges and universities for a century. You can read a dozen of the reports prepared uh, by ACHA, they're online. And more recently, with the emergence of COVID-19, ACHA formed its COVID-19 Task Force in February. Actually, it was Valentine's Day. Uh, this group of nine members immediately went to work and started providing weekly updates for all of us. Shortly thereafter, the task force was overwhelmed with all that needed to be done, as so many on the campus, in the community, and beyond were and still are looking to the health leadership on campus for guidance. So the task force expanded with a call to emeritus members, and now the task force has 24 members plus ACHA staff. Through all of this, these task force members with ACHA staff relied primarily on the CDC, the WHO, and ACHA's already existing resources, as well as their own expertise. Let's go to the next slide, please. The initial product came out within weeks of the task force being formed, and it was guidelines for campuses. This focused primarily on student health services, but also to some of the other issues on campus and listed here on this slide. The task force has already offered multiple webinars to members and has partnered with other organizations such as NASPA, NATA, NURSA, ACE, AKUOI, NFID, and others. Next slide, please. 
To help guide the efforts of ACHA and the task force, we undertook a survey of the current status of three broad strands of campus health. They're listed on the left here, medical services, counseling and mental health, and health promotion and wellness. This first survey was open for three days, got a 52% response rate, and the survey and its results are online. The next survey is in its final phases of testing. It go live in about 10, 12 days, and another one for late summer uh, plan, just to get snapshots and help guide the decision making. If we go to the next slide, we can see some other resources that the task force has pulled together. Uh, one is FAQs. You'll see the topic areas on the left, the six topic areas. And then on the right, there's a resource library. And just I wanna highlight that these resources come from the campuses. So it's campus resources. So if you have something, please share it with others. Next slide, please. Most recently, and this came out just two weeks ago, the task force prepared a new document, Guidelines for Reopening, helping a lot in the decision-making for so many campuses right now. Uh, one of the topics in this, the full page out of the 20 page document is housing, and that's our topic for today. So when preparing these guidelines, the overall guidelines on housing, it's important to note a few things. First, these were written in conjunction with the QOI. And the QOI personnel will share more today and have, they already have their own checklist available on their website. Uh, the ACHA task force continues to collaborate specifically with, ACE, with the QOI as they develop more detailed guidelines moving forward. So those conversations are happening now with more coming from a QOI. And the ACHA guidelines understand the importance of local campus decisions. In other words, one size does not fit all. And it's based on numerous factors, such as the size of school, varied housing settings, resources, and other local considerations. And now to the last slide. Just as I reflect on the guidelines in particular, I offer several broad perspectives. And these, these are in the spirit of, we see you, we hear you, we feel you, and we are with you all, with all the work that you are doing and all the uncertainty as we are moving forward together. First, this is uncharted territory. It's not easy for any of us. There's tremendous health and medical expertise within ACHA and its varied networks. Many have experience with other health issues and these are being applied for the uncertainties of today. Second, particularly in the collegiate setting, we are guided by science, good data, and a strong health and safety orientation. Third, while we all have this health and safety orientation, we also have the overlay of student behavior new students and returning students, student affairs professionals, including health promotion and wellness and others without that background, know best how to reach, engage with, connect with, and ideally have success with students acting as we hope they will. We know that this is a challenge. Fourth, as we look at the housing considerations specifically, I see uh, two broad constructs, prevention and intervention. Prevention, things like reducing risk for exposure with policies and procedures and education and communication and engagement. And then intervention issues such as quarantine and isolation. And then last, we must collaborate. We must learn from one another. We must share and we must share the challenges we're facing, both personally and professionally. We need to be thinking together. Undoubtedly, we will not be perfect, but we will all do what we do best. Together, I believe we can succeed. I'll turn it back to you, Robin. Thank you, David. Um, next, we're going to hear from Christina Lowry, who's going to give us an update on OQOI's work on fall housing. Christina? Wonderful. Thank you, Robin. Um, as Robin mentioned, I'll be speaking as a member of the Future of Housing Work Group for OQOI. Um, first, I want to take 10 seconds just to thank our colleagues at USM and Health Services. They have just been tremendous partners through all of this and have an uncanny ability to keep all of our students' best interests balanced as they're helping us make decisions. And I hope that um, the partnerships are going just as well on every other campus. Um, I know all of our health services professionals do just tremendous work. Um, so to talk about the future of housing work group, um, this is a work group of housing professionals. Um, it's a six week work group and we're nearing the end of week four. Um, that timeline was dictated because we really wanted to make sure that we are being responsive to the needs of the membership and being able to help decision making where the schools were at. 
There are eight members from a variety of institutions. It's a tremendously talented group of people. We've identified topics that uh, our membership is interested in hearing about. We've been gathering resources. Um, as all of you have been doing, we've been watching all of the different information as it's been coming out and really trying to help make sure that we're getting that to our membership. We've been collaborating with other professional associations doing this great work of trying to make some sense in our COVID-19 world um, and offering some webinars and roundtables to start conversations and offering content. Next slide. Uh, and so on this workforce, there are eight subcommittees to address different topic areas. And these topic areas were informed by a lot of the roundtable questions that we were getting as people were communicating with each other. Um, what really seemed to float to the top for folks as far as decision making? And I'll share just a little bit about what each subcommittee is considering. Um, so capacity and assignments really seems first and foremost in everybody's minds. Um, and that work group is looking at different models um, and bringing together some considerations that institutions can make around their capacity and assignment for housing. The risk management legal and communication group um, is, is looking at uh, communication and contract language um, and what that all means as we come back to the, uh, to the institution in the fall. Staffing and human resources are tackling a couple of areas, including training um, and caring for our staff, knowing that this work is um, not only um, mentally taxing, but also physically um, putting folks at risk as well. And so how can we help support and protect our teams? Community building will look very different in the fall. And so this team is looking at uh, different avenues for that, including looking at different vendor softwares and electronic means of creating community. Um, and also occupancy-based community. Um, you know, if we have lower occupancies, what does community really look like? And also with making collaborations around campus to be able to get content to students. The Operations and Processes Committee is looking at budgetary impacts, um, dining. We know that that's a big area that we're gonna have to look at in the fall, um, but even in the residence halls, the impact of students perhaps bringing a lot more of their food back to their residence hall room um, and not having the in-dining hall experience. Um, Move-in processes and what that looks like. Um, and also bathroom considerations. Again, we know that that's a really big topic as we talk about how to mitigate risk. The equity and inclusion group is looking at social justice elements, um, including pricing impacts um, and, and how we're managing costs. The student discipline group is looking at policy adjustments and, um, and public health campaigns. Um, certainly, as we know, when we look at student discipline, certainly part of it is policies and how we're doing follow-up, but a lot of it is preventative as well. Um, and the last group is mitigation. Um, so looking at quarantine and isolation plans, bringing some considerations to the group, as well as what PPE recommendations there are. Um, and the work will continue to come out of these groups for the next two weeks, um, different round tables um, and different pieces of guidance. Next slide. One of the pieces of guidance that uh, has been put out already is the future of housing checklist. And this is a checklist of information and considerations that schools can make as they're looking at their fall and what it might look like. Uh, the first one is to model different housing capacity scenarios. And I'll gloss over that one now because I'll come back to it in just a few minutes. Um, to evaluate COVID-19 quarantine and isolation capabilities, this is mission critical for the fall. Um, and so we're walking, watching recommendations um, and um, looking at the impact on capacity um, of what taking those quarantine isolation spaces might look like. Preparing in, to support staff and student leaders with training, support, resources, and protective equipment. Implement mitigation strategies to protect, protect all community members, including reporting symptoms, plexiglass barriers, and other mitigation strategies. Initiating discussions with college and university legal counsel regarding modifications early in the process. Um, how do we create new policies? How are we adhering to those new policies and communicating them? Um, how are we managing refunds if that's a, a factor as well? Um, coordinating purchasing of critical supplies and PPE, um, signage and other COVID related items. Um, we know that this is time sensitive. We know that right now there's a delay in ordering these things. Um, and a lot of times, um, especially for our vendors, we look and um, it's an August delivery date. And so looking at these things now, um, even though we might not have all decisions finalized is really critically important. Tapping into current thinking of peers in your region or other regions, um, the CDC especially is a, a resource. Um, our CDC in Maine has told us, don't go it alone. Um, definitely talk to the people in your area who understand the impact um, and spread in your community the most. Familiarize yourself with sources of information and guides on managing COVID-19 in different spaces. 
Um, the CDC is one of the uh, sources that we recommend. Um, the WHO is also one. Um, AKUHOI is an international organization, so there are some resources there that address our international constituents as well. And then familiarizing yourself with the KUHOI resources. Um, and I invite everybody on this call to do the same. Um, there's many resources that um, are on the KUHOI page that are um, open to anybody who's um, interested in looking. Um, we have straw polls that we've been taking of our membership. Um, and there's four, I believe, up there right now. There's community threads of discussion. Um, and there's also round table recordings that are a great uh, insight into what different people are thinking. Next slide. And so these are some of the straw poll results from our last straw poll. 75% of institutions expect to make a decision between early June and mid-July. Um, and so we all see that some schools are coming out with models and making decisions. And so it might feel a little bit like you're behind the times and trying to make some decisions. Um, but we thought that was really interesting for folks to know that about 75% of folks are still in the decision-making process. And just under 50% of them said that they were more than a month away. Um, and so certainly we all want decisions timely so we can be able to make some plans around them. Um, but if it feels like there's tremendous pressure, just know that you're you're in a good group that's still making lots of decisions. 65.1% of our membership said they were corresponding with peers outside of their institutions on a weekly basis, which is huge and very important. Um, again, that's one of the things that we've gotten a lot of guidance out uh, about is that connecting with people, um, especially in their region, is really important in being able to make some good decisions. Um, and the last straw poll told us that the topics that people were most interested in were capacity models, uh, the, what housing might look like in the fall, mitigation strategies, particularly quarantine and isolation spaces, and risk management and legal, because those are uh, decisions, again, that need to be made in a timely way to be able to communicate to students. Um, and the straw polls are all on the Akuhawai website. So if you're interested in looking at any of those results, they're open to anybody who navigates to the website. Next slide. Um, and so capacity models, this really is what's on everybody's mind. Um, and so as schools are modeling, um, they really should be looking at multiple capacities um, and lo looking at a large variety of capacities. Uh, a lot of times what we see happening right now is um, somebody will make a decision and that decision will sort of ripple throughout higher education as folks look at it, weigh it, try it on, see what they think about it. And then a few days later, a new, a new capacity model comes out and the same thing happens. Um, and it, that process is really good. Um, but what we want to make sure is we're we're really taking all of those different options into consideration, especially because different campuses have so many different considerations as far as the kind of housing they have, um, whether it's community bathrooms or individual bathrooms, whether it's an urban environment or a suburban environment. There's lots of different things to take into account. And so looking at all of those different models, um, and especially looking at local institutions and what they're doing, as well as peer institutions. Um, these models should include bathroom load, as we know that this is impactful in congregate living situations. Um, and so, uh, for example, um, for us, uh, the single uh, bedroom model um, was helpful to look at, but we also saw with that that there was still one floor that had 17 people using a bathroom. Um, and so when we think about risk, that's a that's high risk situation. Um, and so that bathroom load is just as important as the capacities of the room. Um, and then a budget model should be separate, not to conflate the two issues, but readily available. Well, the reality is that budget is important in the conversations that we're having, um, but it shouldn't detract from the initial conversation about safety of our students. A few models that are going around um, are status quo, you know, normal business and how we would normally operate in the fall. Single occupancy rooms with single occupancy restrooms. This certainly is an ideal, though it's not very realistic for most campuses. Um, knowing that most residence halls were built with community bathrooms in mind, um, very few institutions have the ability to go with that model. Single occupancy rooms with a community restroom, um, and then family unit style housing. Um, and this has been one that's really kind of uh, blossomed in the last couple of weeks. Family unit coming from uh, CDC recommendations about how folks should quarantine with their family unit. And then when we overlay that on a residential population, the question comes, well, who is your family unit? Um, so for example, the population that I talked about is that 17 people sharing a path in a family unit. Uh, but as we've kind of developed this idea and understanding what the family unit is, there's some schools that are, are really thinking about rooms and bathrooms together and thinking of those folks as a family unit. Um, so perhaps we um, have a you know, four person suites and that's a family unit. So if one of those folks gets sick and we need to isolate them, the other three can still quarantine in place um, and it mitigates some of the need for quarantine housing. So as long as those three people are still in the space together and using the bathroom, that might be an option as well. 
So those are a few models. Um, there's also different shades of gray in between all of those as well. Um, and so again, when you're looking at your institution models, um, it's great to look at um, some of these, but also adjusting to what the, the physical structure uh, is, of the residence halls is as well. Next slide. Um, and so a few uh, factors in decision making when it comes to housing. Um, we know that you're getting asked many questions from many different people on your campus. Um, it certainly is good to um, let those folks know that they've got professional organizations that they can also lean on. Um, and so, you know, APA um, can help some of our custodial folks. Aku Hawaii is here for our residential life folks. Um, and there are lots of different professional organizations to help folks make sense of all the information that we're all getting. Um, tapping into resources in your area, um, local and federal CDC guidelines are definitely, um, you know, very important. Uh, county health officials and local constituents. So I, I've heard a few schools talk about how their county health officials really seem to be driving a lot of what the policies are going to be on campus. And so recognizing that that might actually be where a lot of the locus of control over where your capacity models come from. Other institutions in your area are tremendously important. Don't go it alone. They understand the unique circumstances that you might be working through as far as spread in your area. Um, and, and it's one of the biggest pieces of advice that um, seems to kind of ripple again and again is to make sure that you're not going it alone and talking with others. Um, looking at many different models and not just the latest model. Um, the latest model is always cool to kind of try on, but again, really getting that bird's eye view of, of what everybody is doing and being able to best fit that for your campus. Um, and absolutely critical is making sure that we're involving the people who will be implementing policies. Um, so as we make decisions, um, that the folks that will be on the ground really making these happen are, the, are having a say and helping us find if there's gonna be any stumbling blocks or any additional pieces of training that we can offer for folks. Next slide. Um, and then this is my last slide. It's upcoming sessions um, through Aku Hawaii. Um, and so if you go on our website, you can find these. Um, but these are some great resources coming up in the next week. Um, so if um, you or, or anybody in your institution might find these helpful, you can find these right on the Aku Hawaii website. And that's all for me, Robin. Great. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, now we're going to move on um, to hear from Linda Casper who will discuss the University of Georgia's decision-making process and their plans for the fall. Linda? Wonderful, thank you, Robin. So first, just a little bit of shout out. The University of Georgia is the flagship institution for the state of Georgia. We were chartered in 1785. Um, we were the first public university in our country, making UGA the birthplace of higher education in America. And while we have a presence in every county in Georgia, I work on the main campus in Athens, which is where I share my information with you today. Next slide, please. So a little bit of context on our campus, because as, as Christina was just sharing, the context in which you're making decisions is very important. And you'll see that we have two very different campuses that we're talking with you about today. So there are 39,000 students that attend the University of Georgia, and we reside in a medium-sized town of about 100,000 people. In terms of students that live on campus in the residence halls, we house 8,400 students on campus. And this includes traditional residence halls, suite-style residence halls, as well as campus apartments. We do have a live-on requirement for our first-year students, and we have about 5,600 of those that are expected to come to us this August. Um, but in addition to first-year students, we also house a number of upper-class students, a number of graduate students. We do have some family housing, and we also house um, a number of visiting scholars. From an organizational perspective, we are a comprehensive housing operation. We include three departments, so we um, have all of our own facilities, housing facilities in-house. We also have administration and communications that takes care of things like our IT, our marketing, our assignments, et cetera. And then we also have residence life um, that also includes a security force. Overall, 250 full-time staff uh, work in university housing, and we also employ about 600 student staff, both as resident assistants and desk staff. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to go back just for a moment and discuss what happened in the past two months because for our campus, and I suspect for many of your campuses, our quick actions over the last couple of months may have set a precedent in terms of how others are um, gauging your future uh, actions. Uh, and as at UGA, we received many positive kudos from our constituents for our move out process. I know that expectations continue to be high from senior leadership that we can continue that trajectory as we move forward. Um, and many of our shifting protocols are now helping us define uh, how we look ahead. And so for us for spring, the University of Georgia is one of 26 campuses in the university system of Georgia, which is important to know. 
many decisions for us are made at the system level rather than at the campus level. We were on spring break when the announcement came to suspend instruction for two weeks, and at that time, housing quickly operationalized a plan for students to return in small batches to gather items they might need for that extension. Well, then, just a few days later, another decision came from the system saying that we were going to go online for the rest of the semester and we needed to close the residence halls. Okay, we then had less than 24 hours to submit our plans to safely move students. And some of the things that we did, we used checkout appointments, uh, only allowing 3% of any one community uh, to be in the building at any one time. We were very fortunate that the process um, in our housing software that we use during student check-in, we were able to quickly modify and adapt during our checkout process. We suspected that some students may become impatient, and so we used our wonderful partnerships with our campus police and parking to assist us in ensuring that only those students with checkout appointments enter campus um, and the parking lots next to the residence halls. That really helped, again, uh, limit the density in any one residence hall at a time. We also asked students to bring no more than two people with them to move out. You'll see this again when I talk about our move-in process. We had checkout appointments that were lim that limited students to two hours. We asked that only one family unit be in an elevator at any one point. And while we typically require students to remove their trash, clean their rooms, and donate any unwanted items, for this move out, we asked that they only take what they needed and wanted and that they left the rest. In addition to this being great for limiting the amount of time that each student was in the hall, it also worked very well um, to secure some work for those 250 housing staff as we completed our move outs on March 29th. And I will let you know that we are in the last building right now removing the trash. So that has kept us busy for the last few months. Um, in addition from the move out, we also created a process for students who were not able to return um, for a variety of reasons and then also accommodate students to continue to live on campus when they had no other place to go. Next slide, please. Summer, right now, life has become somewhat routine for us on campus. Uh, we were allowed to continue to house those same students from the spring semester into the summer who have extenuating circumstances, and we have consolidated them to the communities with private bedrooms and bathrooms. So we've re really severely limited our operational aspect while we continue to focus on those students still living with us. Um, some of our work recently has been focused more with our legal counsel, and Christina was talking about that, looking at our contracts. We already, before COVID even became um, part of our vernacular, had contracted with 2,500 returning upper class and graduate students. For these students, we have sent out communication offering a very limited window for them to cancel without cancellation fees if they no longer feel safe living in the residence halls. And while I am slightly worried about the budget being an auxiliary unit, student safety and confidence in the school to do the right thing was the driver of this offer. We are still in the middle of this process, but as of today, we have not had many students take us up on this. I would say to people, depending um, on how your off-campus market um, managed refunds or not this past spring, you may or may not see many takers as well. We have additionally adapted our new contracts for new students who will begin picking their rooms for fall in the upcoming weeks. And while we did um, decide to continue to um, have a first year live-on requirement, we have uh, included COVID-19 as a reason that a student could be exempted from this requirement if they submit a request. Next slide, please. Um, looking ahead to fall, the context for your campus is so important in adapting to the ACHA guidelines. For UGA, we've been looking really in depth at our reality. We, if we went to all single rooms, would only be able to accommodate 5,100 students. And even then, over 2,300 of those rooms are in areas with shared common bathrooms. Somebody posed a question before the webinar about the ratios of our bathrooms and how many students are there. And I will just say, knowing that number is important, I know that from some renovation and construction work that we do, our highest ratio at UGA is eight to one with number of students to a bathroom fixture. However, some of our residence um, halls are as low as five to one. We are also looking at different options there with maybe assigning students to a specific toilet or shower stall or sink. All of this, again, as you see at the bottom of the slide, uh, relies on students following the rules, but that may then, again, from that family unit area, allow us uh, some flexibility there. Other factors that you do want to consider with that family unit, is it the room or is it the floor? Uh, fortunately, again, being part of a system, the, the University of Georgia system helped us define this and they have defined that the family unit for us is the student room. So if a roommate has symptoms or test positive, then we would only need to quarantine or isolate those two students. Other campuses I have heard uh, maybe defining this as the floor 
Um, and in that case, you may choose to isolate or quarantine the ill person and keep the floor together. There are different options there. Either way, it's really important for you to define this or seek some guidance on how to define this, as this will determine other decisions, such as how many rooms you may expect to have offline in the fall for isolation spaces. Additionally, some policies, we're looking at our guest policy for students, perhaps limiting the numbers, number of visitors a student can host. Um, we're also looking at limiting them to common areas as the larger the space, you all know this, um, the easier to socially distance and we can better clean and keep cleaning supplies in the common areas. And lastly, um, you know, many students typically set up their rooms with their heads facing each other. And in some of our residence halls, their faces may be four or five feet apart. And so do we want to suggest that maybe people switch that to a head to toe arrangement so people's heads are further away from each other while they sleep? So again, we're really trying to get in the weeds and think about things. And then the last bullet, we're partnering with students in cleaning. We have typically offered weekly cleaning of bathrooms um, that are in more private spaces. And not only does this increase interaction, with our housekeepers and our students, um, but also ending this practice will allow us to spend more time cleaning common areas and bathrooms. Next slide, please. Move in. Um, this is where the context of move out was very critical. Our system office really asked us to take lessons that we had learned um, and apply those to how we move um, people in and out. So again, what was a two day move in process will now be a four day move in process. However, it, it's harder to control as when you have 30 people in a building at one time, the next hour you have 60, the next hour you have 90, and so it increases. But we are trying and looking at signage and continuing to evaluate, um, continuing to limit the amount of people numbers of students that people can have helping them, encouraging stair use, one elevator per family again as well. Um, yeah, we're also looking at the, the last to look at from a community development perspective, the use of volunteers and the, the use of RAs to try to shift those roles so they're no longer having such high touch and, and close in-person interactions with the families that they have. Next slide. Workforce implications. So while some of our staff um, are currently working from home, majority of the housing staff have actually been still reporting to work every day. So things that we have started and we've continued to do. And actually, we've seen that many of our staff are really enjoying the, the increased flexibility that they have with work. We've um, immediately shifted to shift work to reduce the try to to try to reduce the amount of numbers of any one staff or any staff concentration in any one building at any one time. We're adjusting the times that staff are clocking in and clocking out. We're using automated um, lunch deductions where we can, having people take their break times and lunch times outside, um, and also making sure that not everybody goes to lunch at 12 noon. We've also defined our teams that are working together, trying to keep them in five or six person units so that if one person on the team may have a positive test, then it will only impact quarantining or isolating those six staff members rather than everybody um, who's on the team. We've also done um, increased training in general for the chemicals that we're using, et cetera, to clean and making sure that we're keeping up to date with the multiple guidelines from the CDC and from our state. Um, and we continue to collaborate heavily with our university facilities and emergency management. And one thing, again, that I'm proud of from a strong collaboration is we have created a campus-wide team to clean any spaces um, that may uh, need a deeper cleaning because somebody experiences a positive test with COVID. Next slide, please. Now, while as an auxiliary, we have had very tight budgets right now, we still know that we need to invest in our communities and invest in the safety of our students. And so I have on here a list uh, of things that we are considering purchasing, and this is by no means all inclusive, and some of these items are easier to come by than others, but we are definitely trying to purchase these things quickly. Um, fortunately, our university purchasing is still allowing us to make purchases, but garbage, you know, Christina talked about this a little bit, where you can see the impacts of one unit's decisions on the other. She talked about the community impact of not eating in the dining halls, we also try to look at just the, the refuse and the garbage and composting opportunities in the residence halls with so much increased food waste um, coming back to students' halls this year. And so again, we're having these conversations early and often so that we can talk about these things. Next slide, please. This is my last slide about policies. And really what I wanted to mention here is looking at all of these places where you have practices that might not be sort of top of your brain to think about. But we're looking at, for example, evacuation procedures for each community. When a fire alarm goes off, typically students exit a community and wait in the adjacent building's lobby. And that 
isn't a smart approach with COVID. And so we're really looking now, where are smaller spaces that students might be able to go to and how can we address, uh, address our communication with these students um, to keep them posted on what might happen. RE floor meetings, um, you know, it's not really feasible anymore for an RE to meet with 30 or 40 students that might be on their floor. But as we're adjusting our move-in process, at least for that first floor meeting, we're asking REs just to meet with maybe the 10 students who just moved in that day on a nightly basis and in a larger space. There's some other policies there. We also recognize that there's many things that are conflicting priorities. Uh, we don't have all the answers here, and certainly I don't know which way to go on any of these if you're looking for, for definites. But with propping doors, you know, fire code doesn't allow us to prop doors, but we definitely want to limit touch points. So what do you do with that? And while some are suggesting that maybe we remove locks from bathrooms for the same reason, does that increase a student's sense of safety or security? Uh, water fountains, we've been trying to keep you know, students sustainable for years, uh, but what do we do about that? So that's it for me. I hope that that was helpful. Thank you for joining me today. I wish you all well and go dogs. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Um, last but not least, we are going to hear from Dr. Horton, who will discuss the housing and health uh, plans at um, Washington and Lee. Dr. Horton. Thank you, Robin. I want to start by introducing you to Washington and Lee University. This is the historic colonnade at the heart of our campus. We're a small private liberal arts university located in the town of Lexington in the rural mountains and valleys of Western Virginia. We're not too far off the beaten path, however, since Interstates 81 and 64 intersect here as people head north, south, and east, west for travel through the Mid-Atlantic region. WNL is known both for its academic excellence and the quality of its student life experience. Next slide. Our total enrollment is about 2,200 with over 1,800 undergraduates and about 400 law students. So quite different from University of Georgia. First year students, sophomores and juniors are all required to live in campus housing while seniors and law students typically live off campus in the local community in rental housing. Next slide. Our campus housing consists of two first year residence halls with traditional dormitory style rooms, shared hall bathrooms and common areas and live in resident assistance for each hall. Upper division housing is a mixture of apartments, townhouses, Greek houses, and theme houses. Community assistants or house directors live in these areas as well to provide support to students. Next slide, please. Devonell started its contingency planning process for return to work, return to school, almost as soon as we made the decision in mid-March, in fact, on Friday the 13th, to close down and send everyone home to finish out the school year. Today is our last day of classes. Initially, there were four core working groups named to begin the process. Next slide. That soon expanded, however, to a dozen topic-specific working groups. The group doing the most work on housing questions is the opening of school group, but Greek life groups looking at dining and other student services, including health services, have also been involved. Next slide. Some of the basic questions that we're all dealing with are those noted here. Many of these have already been discussed and I'm not gonna repeat them, but we're also struggling with double rooms versus singles. Um, if we don't think we can safely accommodate everyone who's required to live on campus with our stock of housing, where could they live? There are really limited options in our community. Um, how do we handle bathrooms and shared common areas? One idea we've had is, you know, can we find a way to facilitate having only one person using a bathroom at a time with signage and get everyone to clean high touch surfaces as they leave to reduce risks? Next slide. Um, other questions we're considering relate to the move in process. Again, as already discussed, we're working towards systems to spread out arrivals, avoid large crowds on move in days and minimize building entry by anyone other than residents. We also want to have a system in place to screen everyone on arrival for current fever or symptoms recent high-risk contacts, history of COVID-19 illness, and to get them signed up for a system of daily reporting of symptoms or exposures that will help us enhance early identification of possible cases and rapid assessment. Next slide. The first year experience um, is critical for our students. We typically have over half of our first year class arrive early for fall sports or pre-orientation trips, which include hiking trips on the Appalachian Trail, as well as community service programs. Some or all of those programs may need to be put on hold for this fall. The rest of the first year class then arrives about a week before classes start for orientation programs, which we do not do during the summer. That involves lots of small and large group gatherings for programs, discussions, and community building activities. 
We are planning for ways we can provide those in small groups and or with virtual gatherings while considering the impact of such modifications on the outcomes we want to achieve, which creates strong bonds between students and with the university. Next slide. We're also considering as the rest of our students return to campus, how we will train our resident assistants and community assistants with all the usual information they need, as well as how to practice physical distancing, universal masking and enhanced cleaning and hygiene efforts, and how to recognize possible coronavirus illness symptoms. We're cognizant that these students will be on the front line to teach and model these behaviors. Let us know if there are problems with compliance and help alert us to students who may be ill or need extra support. Next slide. If any of you are familiar with WNL, you know that our Greek organizations are central to the majority of the social activities for our students. Between 75 and 80% of our undergraduates belong to a Greek organization, and many of our sophomores live in Greek houses. Chapter members dine together in the houses, which are located on or adjacent to campus. And there are many other common spaces in the houses which are utilized by all chapter members, not just those who live there. Each facility will need to be assessed for recommended modifications for safe living and dining, maximum occupancy in common spaces to allow physical distancing, et cetera. Social events in the Greek houses must be registered with the university and must adhere to specific guidelines. We will work to enhance those expectations. Social events also occur in the many off-campus student residences in the surrounding community and are beyond the scope of university oversight. We are all worried about how students will behave in those settings. Next slide. We're actively developing prevention messages and strategies to disseminate them through multiple media platforms that we hope will resonate with our students. The core of those messages is that we are all in this together. What I do protects you, what you do protects me, and what we both do protects our entire community as well as the college experience we both want to have. We plan to engage student leaders to provide those messages and model expected behaviors. Areas that we think will be the most challenging are for students to minimize the number of quote unquote close contacts that they have, to wear masks during social gatherings where physical distancing is difficult to maintain, and to comply with daily reporting of symptoms and known contacts. We are exploring technology strategies to enhance compliance with self-monitoring and reporting. We'll watch how well our students are engaging in these public health practices, especially with the help of feedback from our Res Life staff and adapt our messaging as needed. Next slide. Strategies we are considering to help us through the return to campus transition and moving forward during the school year, including asking students arriving from high prevalence areas to self quarantine, possibly for up to two weeks before coming to campus, screening everyone on arrival for symptoms and exposure history, and possibly doing some screening testing, um, not likely with all students uh, on arrival, um, and then periodic screening testing thereafter. It's not clear yet whether that kind of surveillance testing is feasible in our setting or if that information will meaningfully inform our operations. We're working with our state health department on that, those options. We're also working on training student affairs staff who, who might be able to help serve as adjunct contact tracers if needed and to set up specific housing spaces we can use to relocate students from on-campus housing into quarantine or isolation rooms as medically appropriate. Next slide. We're also starting to think about how to handle special housing needs for students who would typically be required to live on campus, but where that might not be the best place for them. They will likely be granted exceptions on reasonable request. We're also working on plans to establish appropriate points of contact to support the basic needs, care coordination, medical monitoring, and academic support of students in isolation for illness or in quarantine. Next slide. And this is my last slide, as I'm sure is true for everyone on this webinar. The further we go in our planning process, the more questions we find that need to be answered. We're all looking for guidance from our regional, state, and national experts. I want to say thank you to ACHA for continuing to listen to the questions we have, giving us a platform to share questions and ideas, and working to provide the information and guidance we are all looking for. Thank you. Now I'll turn the program back over to Robin. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Horton. Um, <clears throat> Um, and thank you to all our speakers. Um, before I open it up to questions, um, I, I just want to preface this by saying that you know nobody has all the answers right now, like Dr. Horton said. There's there's no one size fits all. Um, so the best we can do today is to ask our presenters 
to tell us about their experiences and some of the discussion around these questions, and then just to give us their professional opinion. So given that, um, let's jump in. Um, as, as I think Linda mentioned, um, there are a lot of bathroom questions. Um, so Christina, I know that, uh, that you guys are talking a lot about the bathrooms. Maybe you can talk a little bit about these shared bathrooms and what you're doing. Um, do you have some recommendations for these more traditional residence halls where there are you know, 30 students sharing one communal bathroom? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we got kind of a cluster of questions related to different bathroom ratios. Um, the reality is there isn't a recommendation yet. Um, the federal CDC has some risk levels um, related to different occupancies, um, but there isn't any actual numbers behind that. Um, it does sound like some of our professionals around the country are getting some guidance from their county health officials, uh, but as yet there's really no formal guidance on a good ratio of student per bathroom or student per fixture. Um, and so one of the things that I would suggest as folks are looking at this, you know, certainly we want to mitigate risk and it's a complicated equation that comes down to access to education and, and possibly some budget considerations as well. But um, the reality is that we know, you know, the, the less students who are using a bathroom, the better. Um, but knowing that uh, a couple of the questions really related to having, you know, a larger number of students per restroom. Um, some of the strategies that I'm hearing from different institutions are the limiting um, of using other restrooms, um, which could be a, a big thing. So, for example, if we've got 30 people using a restroom and then five of them go upstairs to use the other restroom sometimes, that's certainly going to impact some possible community spread. And so limiting students to using particular restrooms. Um, providing cleaning products, I heard somebody talk about that today, um, so that the students can um, clean up after themselves. Installing additional hand washing stations to reduce restroom use. So, for example, if we're really trying to encourage our students to wash their hands pretty frequently, um, or if they just need to go in and use uh, the sink to brush their teeth, um, offering up additional sink stations, which are a little easier to install than additional restrooms, for example. Um, signing fixtures. Um, I, I heard Linda talking about that a little bit. Um, and so it could be that, you know, these these three students are using these fixtures. And so um, when we think about then if we get somebody who's sick, being able to then identify who might be touching the same surfaces gets a little bit easier. Um, and then reducing those touch opportunities. Um, again, you know, if it's possible, propping open the, the bathroom door or, you know, finding other opportunities to reduce touch surfaces. Um, if you're at your institution and you're trying to, to help folks come to some decision making around student per restroom ratio, one good tool could be to tabletop some of these policies. So um, sit around a table and say, okay, you know, we've got 30 students using a restroom, one of them tests positive, what are we doing? Um, you know, are, are we quarantining them all? Are we just quarantining the roommate? Um, how are we communicating with people? Um, and I, I struggle to use the word comfortable. Are we comfortable with that communication? Um, I think we're all very uncomfortable with a lot of what's happening right now. Um, but do we feel like we can, um, with a straight face, talk to families about, um, you know, and communicate with them about why we made the decisions we did about occupancy? Um, and then another piece of this is that, um, and it's a big question that we all have, is how do we enforce um, these recommendations and policies that we're making for students? Um, and how do we educate them? And that certainly is compounded if we have more students per restroom. Um, so if there's 30 students per restroom and we're trying to get some good social norming around good hygiene habits, cleaning up after themselves, that's all compounded if we have more people per restroom versus if we have um, a suite with four, for example. Those are just some considerations um, that I've heard um, from colleagues. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, Linda, you had mentioned that um, you you are defining a family unit a specific way. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you you came to that decision? Did the Student Health Center help you create that policy? Um, so for us, it was actually some guidance from the system office. So um, they had asked each of our presidents to put forward a plan for reopening. And our president put nine task forces together. And that was one of the recommendations from the student life group that I um, was serving on. Um, Dr. Russo, the head of our student university health center was also on that committee. 
and that was the system office that that asked us to basically make some assumptions as we moved forward and one of those assumptions was to define the family unit as the room now for us the thing that they didn't define is the community bathroom area and christina just did a really good job talking about that so for us if it's a room and it has a private bathroom that's a different ask than if it's a room and it's a community area and so for us we're continuing to have conversations with what do we do about community bath areas and one of them that is is sort of kind of floating to the top right now although we certainly have not uh, we're not done making the cake yet, if, I, if that analogy makes any sense, <laughs> is that we're going to assign um, a number of rooms per fixture. But again, that relies on students actually honoring that um, and needing what that might be. The other thing that we're doing is also, uh, while we're increasing cleaning and we're doing that seven days a week um, rather than just five days a week, we are also adding a lot more soap. Um, you know, for, for a lot of purposes where we can add soap because we think that that's better than the hand sanitizer, adding hand sanitizer where we're not able to add soap. But in the bathroom area, encouraging students to clean their spaces that they can if that's the door handles or that's the, the shower knobs or toilet handles or things like that. But we're trying to give, evaluate products and get other products in there. Um, you really asked about the family unit, but I think for us right now, it's still just the room, but we know that that doesn't, um, that doesn't resolve the whole picture of, of the bathrooms. Right, and exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Linda, has the University of Georgia made a decision yet? Have they announced a decision? We have announced a decision that we are open in the fall and we continue to evaluate and plan for what that reopening is. Um, each president did submit their plans uh, to the system office. They were due this past Monday and we're waiting for final approval on those for those plans. And so we expect in the next couple of weeks that that will come. But with the assumption that we're open in the fall, we were asked um, to, to reopen in phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, and bringing back students and bringing back staff, bringing back athletics, et cetera, et cetera. And so in each one of those areas, um, the university made some recommendations and we're just awaiting word on those right now. Okay, thank you. Um, Jane had mentioned, um, she had she talked about in her um, talk about um, arrival and screening. And I was wondering if maybe Christina and um, Linda, you could talk a little bit about your arrival. Um, are you looking to do screening questionnaires? Are you doing testing? Are you talking about staggering based on, you know, coming from high prevalence or low prevalence areas? And how about in international students? Maybe, uh, Christina, you could take that first. Sure. Um, so one of the things that we're working on right now through our housing software is a questionnaire to students to gather some information before they come to campus. Um, we're looking to identify folks that are some of our more vulnerable populations um, in terms of um, you know, if they if they get COVID, um, you know, that that would be pretty impactful for them. Um, we did think that if the CDC ended up having to address anything on campus in the fall, that really is going to be one of the first questions that they're going to ask. Um, we're also talking with folks about um, different plans and where they're coming from. Um, one of the things that's interesting about Maine right now is we currently have a 14 day quarantine for anybody who's coming in from out of state. Um, if that is still in effect in August, um, then what uh, our, our soft plan, um, in case anybody's sending their children to us, um, our soft plan is to quarantine those folks on campus for two weeks beforehand. Um, we just don't think it's feasible to ask 400 incoming students to find quarantine space um, outside of campus. So we'd bring them to campus and support them in that way um, if that's happening. Um, otherwise, we're gonna continue to watch the governor's recommendations on staggering. Um, certainly when it comes to our, our major move-in, we're going to stagger uh, quite a bit more. Um, we've, we definitely are hoping to do some testing. Um, our state just announced yesterday some additional expansion for testing, um, and we're hoping that, that it will include some testing for um, incoming college students, especially because um, in the state of Maine, we're in um, one of the higher prevalence counties. In the state of Georgia, to, to follow up on that, right now um, we don't have definitive answers on that. I know we're we're certainly having conversations about um, testing or not. We have not made a decision on that um, if students get tested before they arrive. Um, although certainly I've heard conversations with that happening. We're looking at getting thermometers in our residence halls for students so that they can do some self-monitoring of their health um, throughout the fall semester. And again, putting that onus on students and, and expecting that they're going to be following the rules and what that might look like. The, the population that we're most have been having conversations about recently is the international student population. I know that our campus continues um, to be online and very few people are coming to campus on a daily basis um, throughout the summer. And again, as we reopen, um, 
if that's in June or July or August, that may shift a little bit. Uh, our international orientation, typically those students arrive about a week or a week and a half before classes begin and working really closely with international colleagues on campus to try to understand if there is a quarantine, what would that look like? We're also being mindful that many of the consulates around the world are not reopening until maybe even July 1st. And so the opportunity for students to come, international students to come on campus and get their visas and everything before they need to arrive and, and arrive for an August uh, class start is also limited. And so we're also looking at other options for those students to maybe start online and then join us in September, or October, or whatever time they're able to get here. So international students in general, we're looking at um, from a lot of different ways from an academic perspective. From a living perspective, we are talking about quarantining and whether that would be in a residential area or maybe in a hotel, and then also who would pay for that and what's reasonable um, in terms of expectations, in terms of uh, food delivery, if they have meal plans, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we haven't landed anywhere in the University of Georgia, but those are certainly on going conversations that we are having as well. Okay, thank you. I'm going to throw it back to David real fast for some final comments and some questions. Yeah, thank you, Robin. Uh, you know, listening to all this, this is this is a challenging time for, for all of us, uh, whether they're an administrator or people in college health or housing, but th this is this is hard. Uh, but this is this is a resilient and an innovative group. And it's my belief we're going to make it through this. So let me let me ask each of the panelists one final question. What has been something good or a win that has come out of this for you? Let me start with uh, Jane. Can I start with you? Sure. Um, I think one of the things that I've really seen as a, a positive coming out of this is um, how much collaboration there has been. You know, I've had the opportunity to work with um, people on my campus that I have never had the opportunity to work with before, and that's been been really good. Um, and also, the, the co collaboration with professional colleagues around the state has really taken off as well. In fact, in Virginia, we've just sort of revived a group that hasn't been active for many years, which is the Virginia College and University Student Health Medical Directors. So we've come up with the acronym vacuumed, V-A-C-U-M-D, and had our first meeting at noon today with um, representatives from 35 or 40 colleges around, across the um, state and our public health, Virginia Department of Health representatives talking about some of these very issues and working collaboratively to come up with guidelines uh, for the state of Virginia and institutions of higher education. So that's been a wonderful win from my perspective. And that's marvelous. That's marvelous. Uh, Linda, how about you? I so want to be a part of the vacuumed group. That is a wonderful name. I love it. Um, for me, I think it's the opportunity to slow down and check in with people. I've seen genuine, you know, curiosity, people checking in with each other, check how's your family doing, et cetera, et cetera. I think, I think that level of humanity, I've really seen increase as everybody is so stressed out, focusing on what we really can. The other piece that I'll just add is just a little piece of grace. I think people have been showing grace knowing that, you know, we haven't had years to make these decisions. We had 24 hours to do this. And, you know, we might've missed a few things, but that's okay. And just on a personal note, I got a complimentary note from the moderator of the parents' Facebook page um, after she moved her daughter out. She shared uh, a lot of kudos that were also on that page. And that page generally for me has been one that I generally um, quint you know, cringe a little bit when I get emails from them because it's generally not complimentary, but they were just so complimentary. And so again, when I think about showing grace and kind of stopping and checking in, seeing that at that's all nice. levels, it's really nice. Yeah, that's very nice. Christina. Yeah, um, I think that one of the, for me really actually has been the future of housing work group through Aku Hawaii. Um, I've got to meet a great new group of professionals um, and get to see their experience and compassion and the authenticity with which they're grappling with some of this stuff. Um, and it's, it's just truly really amazing to be part of that group. Um, and then a little bit closer to home, um, to echo a little bit of what Linda was saying, just the, the checking in with folks. Um, but as we deal with these things that don't necessarily have precedent, um, that people are really finding students at the heart of what they're doing, um, really in a, a genuine way as they try to make decisions, saying what is, what is best for the student um, and it's it's really neat to make sure that that's at the core of what we're doing. Yeah, that's really nice. That's really nice. You know, having worked in residence life, the, the first part of my career for a dozen years, and 
embedded with that within that for myself was health promotion and wellness and drug and alcohol abuse prevention. And then my 30 years with uh, faculty and more research. But for me, what's what's come out of all this is from whether it's the doctors or the nurses, the epidemiologists or the communications experts or the health promotion folks, you know, I, I've seen them, that whole group emerge as a force to be listened to. And, and, and I think what's on the cusp is a force to be reckoned with. Uh, so to me, that's what's come out. It's like, we, we all need, you know, we, those of us who've been trying to promote health, sometimes this falls on deaf ears. And I hope that uh, we're coming into our own in a different way. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's hard that we're having COVID-19 help facilitate this, but uh, I guess I'm hopeful for a, a, a different tomorrow um, as we get past the immediate crisis and uh, what our campuses and what our communities look like tomorrow. Robin, I'm gonna pass it back to you. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you to all our speakers today. We're, we are out at the end of our time. Um, we really appreciate all your valuable insight. All of your questions will be forwarded to AKUI as they continue to work in this area. Um, and ACHA Q&A will be back next Friday um, when we'll discuss contact tracing. And in the meantime, please continue to share your ideas and questions and solutions in ACHA Connect. And please stay safe and be well and have a, a good holiday weekend. Thank you. Goodbye.